Hi everyone. Uh, so today uh, I will speak about um, cross device website, uh, trying to look beyond web APIs um, and see where, where, the, where we are going in terms of the API uh, economy, which is uh, the main uh, theme of this, uh, this uh, conference. So a few words of RESLED. So I created um, the first REST framework for Java back in 2005. Um, we, we grew a large community, and uh, two years ago, we, uh, we started to work on a platform as a service called API Spark. It's an all-in-one platform that lets you create, host, and manage your web API, all from a, a simple web browser, so you don't have to code. Everything is uh, taken care of for, for you. Um, so let's, let's move on. First, try trying to uh, just step back a little bit. Ten years ago, we, uh, we were all um, trying to create classic websites. So if you, if you think uh, about a classic website, it's uh, basically it's a set of information, very valuable information that you want to expose uh, to end users through web browser. So that's nothing new uh, to you. The two important things is that the, it's for end user and it's driven by hypermedia. Uh, so classic websites are the perfect application of REST. Of course, REST was designed to really make the web scale as an hypermedia application, as a fully distributed hypermedia application. So what REST is coming with the six main constraints. You've probably heard about, about them. What is really important, if you read again this dissertation, is that Roy Fielding is talking all the time about hypermedia, uh, user interface. So it's, it's really something that is core to, to REST. Um, so client server, stateless, cache, uniform interface, layer system, and code on demand. All these six constraints constraint define, uh, define REST. And the purpose of REST is a web of hypertext. So fr from this um, classic website, people started to build them initially using very expensive uh, stacks. In the Java world, you had to buy the hardware, the operating system, and the application server. So it was a um, near 2000, very expensive approach. Of course, we had the impact of open, open source. So five years after, most of this stack was fully free, so no more licensing cost. Uh, you only had to take care of the hardware and the, the network, the, the bandwidth. Um, so this was a pretty impressive evolution. In parallel, we, we saw the emergence of uh, web APIs. So um, many people talk about this uh, before and, and yesterday, so I, I won't go into too much detail. From the uh, e-commerce pioneers to the open data trend to the uh, API as a product, uh, actors uh, like Twilio, Stripe, um, uh, and so on. So wh what is a web API? So we, uh, we saw the definition of a classic website. A web API is a tool that allows a company to expose, in some ways, the same information, the same valuable key information, not to end users, but to developers, and in a controlled way without having to expose implementation details. So it's really an interface to this key uh, key information, information that can be structured or flat information. Again, through the web protocol, through typically HTTP. So now from this, um, this point, people had to create both websites to maintain it through the, the stack that we saw before. And in parallel, they started to work on the web API project. So it was a different IT project. They had to select a, a REST framework such as RESLET and, and many, many other ones that, uh, that exist in uh, Java, uh, JavaScript, and, and so on. Um, so what, what is interesting to, to see, and we, we saw that in our community, is that people started to realize that you don't need both an MVC framework and a REST framework to expose your website and your web API. A REST framework ca can do both at the same time. Um, a resource can have multiple representation. One can be in HTML, the other one can be in JSON, uh, and the other one in uh, XML and CSV and, and so on. So in, in REST, you have all the concepts, all the par paradigms uh, that, that you need to, to create a website and a web API. Um, so there is no need to, uh, to, to add uh, an extra paradigm and uh, an, an extra framework. So it's good. It's unifying your, your development. It's, it's much simpler to, to move forward. Then we got the impact of cloud computing. So open source, we saw the, the big change under uh, cloud computing. And what is interesting is uh, people can still use REST framework or a MVC framework. And they deploy it on, on top of a generic platform as a service, using infrastructure as a service and, uh, and hardware that is not anymore under your control. And again, we, we get back some proprietary technology stack. 
uh, if you use uh, Google App Engine, HeroQ, Amazon Web Services, uh, Beanstalk, etc., it's not open source. You don't have access to this technology. You just use it as a service. Uh, but it's fine. People like it because it's faster, it's cheaper. Uh, so that the, the same the same forces that really um, make the, the open source successful, free, it's cheaper, and faster are again at work with uh, cloud computing. So the next step in terms of simplification can be really to merge the, uh, the REST framework layer with a generic class layer. And if you do that, you, you get a, a specialized platform as a service that is really designed on for web APIs, for website, where you can really think about resources representation and, and sub thinking about, you know, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, web application, servlet, and, uh, and so on, and the equivalent for JavaScript and other languages. So it's a platform as a service that will be fully aligned on the uh, principle of the web. And API Spark is, uh, is one example of such a platform. Of course, you have, um, in terms of clients, web browser, you have native application, mobile application, connected devices, uh, and so on. Um, one example of that is a backend of service. It's a good example in terms of integration of the IDE, the hosting, the management of, uh, of your backend fully as a service. You don't have to code, you just define what you want to have and you focus on your uh, on the user interface of your application, on the user experience. It's where you, you add the, the most value. So now let's, let's, let's look at, um, at an API and at the anatomy of an API. So an API is first a visible part, really the interface, the contract that, that you see, the set of resources, representation, URIs that define your web API and the way you interact with it from the outside. Uh, under the API, you have an implementation. And, um, and if you combine the contract with implementation and, and the runtime aspect, you get an API, uh, an API provider, I, I would say. And something interesting as well is that for the same contract, you can have multiple implementations. So you can switch from one implementation to the other if it's a standard API. Um, and you can also combine multiple implementations. So if that's the same API, but different data sets, you can join both data sets and, and use them uh, in, in a similar way. So we, we start to have multiple examples of these standard API contracts. Uh, Amazon S3 is a good example. Of course, we have the official implementation, but many, many other storage services are compatible with the S3 interface. Uh, Google Reader was a, a recent example. So people, other companies use uh, the Google Reader API to provide a compatible client. Uh, Atom is another example, and it's, it's going to grow and, and be a, a common pattern in, in the future. So the other change that we see is instead of thinking about stacks, about you know focusing a lot of energy and uh, and thought on your on your backend, on the on this on the code that you need to write to maintain to host to scale, etc., we can start thinking about API and compose them. So the next step is uh, is really the programmable web. Uh, you don't reinvent the, the wheel. We we saw some example uh, with the presentation for, from Mashep. You can use Stripe, uh, SendGrid, Twilio, etc. and add your own data on top of it, and then combine everything as a composite API and re-expose um, this, uh, this uh, higher level API to your clients. Um, so that's, that's really the, the trend going forward. And again, the main driver is a cost saving and the time saving. It's much faster, much easier to reuse an existing API than to um, find a, an open source component and to adapt it and to deploy it and, and so on. So what really matters now, um, the service and the data that, you're, that you are offering, it's really the, the key aspect that you, you need to, to think about. Um, the cost of development, of, of maintenance, of scaling operation of your API is really important as well, much less than the open source nature. So in the past, we are really focusing on making everything open source and having control and not having to pay for it. And now the focus is different. People are, are fine and happy to use Twilio and SendGrid and Amazon Web Services. Even though those technologies are not open source, you can't replicate them, you can't host them on your, on your own machines. But it's so much easier that people are, are willing to, uh, to do that. Uh, so that's really a trend that is, is not going, going back, backward. The important aspect is to have a freemium uh, business model for these services. So people want to be able to use them for free 
up to a certain amount where they are willing to pay for it because it's so critical for, for their activities, their business application. And it's very similar for open source. People were using for like JBoss for free, and at some point when it's really go getting serious in production, people are paying for some subscription for some support uh, to use those uh, technologies. Um, so in some way, if you make a parallel, open APIs are the open source components of the cloud computing world. So it's a real change of, of paradigm of scale. So now let's go back to, uh, to, the, to REST, the architecture style and the limit of REST. Um, so what REST I is not? I it's not a buzzword uh, from non SOAP web APIs. And it's really uh, something we, we need to be careful. Many, many people say, OK, it's a REST API, but it's just it's not SOAP, but it's mostly like a JSON RPC API. In some cases, it's going to be a REST uh, resource-oriented API. But still, it's not going to be driven by hypermedia. It's not going to respect all the constraints of REST. So you, we really need to be careful about this um, using REST as a label, as a tag, to, to sound really cool. Uh, so most of the web API out there are, are not REST. They are not hypermedia driven. There are a few exceptions. Of course, HTML is an exception. Uh, Atom is another example. But um, in most, most cases, it's not a good idea to try to push the REST aspect too much, too far. So REST is not suited. It was not designed for machine-to-machine -machine interaction. It was designed for websites that is accessed by, a, by an, an user using an Apple Media document, Apple Media application. So we need to stop the confusion. And wh one idea that uh, I got a couple of weeks ago was trying to define another architecture style that will be more aligned with the current practices. People are using REST in a pragmatic way. So let, let's try to, um, to set those constraints, those principles, um, more clearly. So we, we don't try to, um, to go too far. So the idea is to keep the best of REST in terms of resource orientation, URIs, resources, representation, and so on. Keeping the, the aspect in terms of network uh, interface using the HTTP application protocol in a meaningful way, content negotiation, caching, conditional method, and so on. But replacing the rest of REST that doesn't make sense for machine-to-machine -machine interaction. So not trying to push, um, you know, hypermedia driven too far, um, and trying to take into account the mobile access and its constraint. You need to make sure that your API can be used in an offline mode, and you need to make sure that you can access it in a very small and fine grain, um, which is not the, the goal of, of REST. So the web API style in its current draft state uh, contains six uh, constraints, client, server, stateless. So some of them are identical to REST, others are, are different. Instead of uh, a uniform interface, we have a custom interface where we really want the user of the interface, the API, to know what are the set of resources. We document them. We, that's the way most API are working. We document and we, uh, we use it, and, and we expect the API to not change. Um, so we need some stability because the machine can't really uh, interpret, adapt to, uh, to an evolution of your API, like uh, a user will be doing by browsing a website. Um, so if we uh, compare REST and, and Web API, they are very close. They are web browsers. Uh, so the common aspect, resource orientation, stateless cache, and layer system. The aspects that are different is one is driven by hypermedia user interface. The other is driven by machine-to-machine -machine interactions. One, we want to make sure that client and server ca can evolve independently. You don't want to recompile the web browser when you just browse to another website. You want to make sure that it's working fine because it's based on, on standard. When you are using a, a web API, each change to the API requires a change to the client and uh, impacts your, your, your application. So you need to make sure that evolution of clients and server are controlled. You need to version, you need to make sure it's stable and, and properly documented. Um, and if you compare Web API to a uh, RPC um, um, approach and, and parading, it's, it's not the same. So it's not trying to say, OK, no REST is not a good idea. Let's just do some RPC stuff like we, we used to do uh, 20 years ago before the, the web was uh, existing. So it's, uh, RPC is driven by uh, services, uh, you know, remote, remote procedures. It's mostly a, a language-based language, a language -based paradigm. Uh, it's not a network-based. HTTP is not like a primary aspect in, in those um, uh, in this paradigm. Um, so, but there are common points, machine-to-machine uh, -machine interaction, uh, evolution of client and server in, in a synchronized way. So it's... So the next step for this um, 
this effort is uh, is trying to discuss with the rest of the community uh, at uh, API Craft at the uh, at the end of July about this project. There is a draft uh, version of this uh, architecture style that you, you can look up on uh, on GitHub and make some contribution. Uh, I really want to make it um, like an open and collaborative effort. So. Make sure to, to check that out. The, the next and the final part of this presentation is going back to the title, the evolution from web API to cross device websites. So web, web APIs, in the end, they are not the most important aspect. It's just an interface to something valuable. So what is the mo most important aspect? It's the data that you expose, the service that you expose, or sometimes the device, the, the hardware that you can control through the, the web API. And the end user, uh, the consumer, the, even the business person, doesn't really care about APIs. Most don't really understand wh wh what it is uh, all about. Um, so let's think about what really matters. What really matters is uh, if we think about the website that we saw, the classic website, the web APIs, and we try to merge both aspects together, what we get in some ways is uh, the same set of information that you expose to a website but that you want to expose in a controlled way through one or multiple APIs. So you want to have not only one API, but you want to have multiple one for each device, because each device has a different user experience, user uh, in interaction uh, mechanism. So when your user interface is a, is a smartphone, you have little of information that you want to retrieve. So you don't want to get like, a very large representation, JSON representation, because it's going to be long to, uh, to, to load on, on your device. Uh, if you are using a web browser with a single page application, you still want to interact you with your API in a JSON way, but you might want to retrieve much more information. Um, and each kind of interaction has a different need. And if you look at Netflix, they have a very uh, advanced usage of web APIs, and they don't have just one API. They have as many APIs as they are supporting devices, hardware devices. So they have one API for Xbox, another one for connected TVs, uh, and so on. Uh, so there is no reason why in the future everyone will not follow the same path. For, so for each channel, you want to have a one API that you control in a very specific way with versioning for each channel. Um, so in the end, you get a cross-device website. So it's, uh, if you go back to the definition, it's going to be, a, again, a tool that allows a company to expose its valuable key information accessible by any kind of machine and by end user. So the idea is really to use the best UI paradigm, depending on the context, um, and, and, and in order to provide a consistent user experience across all these channels. So I want to be able to play a game, use it on my Xbox, move to to website, so I can I can continue and, and, and look up uh, what's going on with my, with my game, and, and then use my smartphone and so on, and still share the same information, the same experience. So final thought, the API economy for me is just an intermediary step uh, to something bigger. And API are just an enabler to cross-device cross -device user experience. And this cross-device user experience, everybody will care uh, about them. So that's really the, the, the message uh, that we need to, to push forward. And, and there is a, a good article in Wired uh, this month about the, uh, the programmable world. So it's the next step of the programmable web. It's really something that we concern everybody uh, uh, in their daily life. So that's all. Thank you very much. <coughs> I guess working, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jerome, for, for this. Do uh, you have any question for about cross device? Cross device, so, OK, cro cross device. Yeah, yeah, cross device website, yeah, sorry. Uh, any question? So uh, I have a question about the, the so your story about the REST uh, RESTlet framework. So when did you come from a, a Java framework for APIs to uh, the, the API Spark platform that you are building? So what was the the, the main thing you were kind of programming uh, non programming language agnostic with your framework, uh, and then you you've gone to a, a cross device website uh, thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I initially, the, the Reset framework was um, designed for Java containers, like servlet containers. We had another edition for like a regular uh, virtual machine. Then we got the JWT edition, the Android edition, OSGI, etc. So we had to maintain, and we still maintain, multiple editions. And we realized that people wanted to access their API through all this, uh, this type of environment. So in some way, it was already like a cross-device um, 
uh, framework. And then the, the next step was uh, trying to rethink um, the way people were building APIs. So with REST API, people have to write a lot of code. It's really for like custom uh, APIs that are pretty sophisticated. So it's a, it's a long project. To get really an API in production is going to be like three months at least of, of development. Then you need to scale it, to maintain, to document it. It's, it's really a long project. So we, we step back and we say, how, how can we improve this experience? If we really want to have like millions of APIs in the coming years, we, we need to rethink the way we, we build APIs. Uh, we, we can't code all, all of them. It's like, like the website. Initially, people were writing CGIs and, and, and so on. And then we, we got the CMS, content management system, the blog engines, and everybody could have its own website very quickly just using a, a web browser. So, so we really try to, s to follow the same path and say, OK, how can we create also an API and manage it from a simple web browser in a couple of minutes? And really, API Spark was uh, designed to, to solve this, uh, this question. OK, is it live yet? It's live, uh, yes. It's live, it's yeah, great. It's okay. uh, on, on in a limited public beta, so you, you need just to sign up and, on, and we will give you an access. So, so it, d can you make a specific code to APIs that attendees to have a specific access? No. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. great. Everyone so who, uh, we'll take it. Who ask an access, we uh, we'll give it. So, oh, great. Thank great. you very much, Mehdi. Thank you, Jerome. So, thank you so much.